just make sure. OK, cool. Um, all right, guys. Um, so. Here is uh, the presentation on history taking. This is going to kind of take you through um, how to take a history and some kind of um, core history taking uh, kind of templates for you to follow uh, when you're doing your skis. All right, so starting history taking, you kind of have to go through WIPQQ um, as you enter the station. Make sure you don't forget this because I did and you lose uh, a few easy marks. Um, it's easy to forget in the kind of the pressure scenario, but make sure you do that as soon as you enter. Introduce yourself, uh, kind of make a good report with the patient, confirm their name and date of birth, um, ask them if they have any questions, any pain, especially for examinations, but also for histories before you start the history. Um, you want to ice them as early as possible. What that is, is ideas, concerns, expectations. So what you want to do is make sure that you uh, identify what the main issue is so you're not wasting your time or with the kind of station time to kind of focus on the wrong symptom. Um, so again, open questions, active listening, summarising, signposting. So again, that's kind of after you've done the history. Uh, so kind of referral to the correct services, um, making sure that you identify what the main issue is and uh, plan ahead. Um, address any other questions after you've done and hand over, uh, you, you would just say I would hand over to this relevant team. In terms of the presenting complaint, this is the kind of the bulk of the history. We're going to get most marks. Why have they come in? Socrates, you hear this time and time again, but it's really important. Um, again, anytime you hear the kind of the buzzword pain, you want to do Socrates and we'll kind of go over what that means. Uh, red flags, really important. Always do this. So fevers, weight loss, night sweats. That's uh, like, like a must in a history, to be honest. Um, and you, again, you're screening for cancers here mainly. Um, and systems review, and we'll kind of have a look at that on the next slide. So I don't know if you've kind of had a look at this in the performer. If you haven't, it's a lot of words. It's quite confusing, to be honest. Uh, but essentially, as you go through each rotation, it will become, uh, it'll become more and more clear, essentially. So again, systemic symptoms, fevers, weight loss, night sweats. That's looking at cancers mainly. Um, it could also be some other things like TB and so on, but mainly cancers. Cardiovascular, again, think of your heart. So you've got chest pain, palpitations being out of your chest. Dyspnea basically means shortness of breath, syncope, again, dizziness. Um, orthopnea and peripheral edema, again, it's to do with heart failure. Uh, so again, the all cardiovascular symptoms that you can kind of screen for when you're doing a focused history. Uh, respiratory symptoms, again, shortness of breath, um, coughing, wheezing, kind of producing sputum. Any uh, kind of coughing up blood called hemoptysis, really important. And SOB just means shortness of breath. So that's the same thing as dyspnea. Gastro is quite um, a wide speciality. So we'll kind of focus on this more when I move on to the kind of the specific history for this. But again, you're looking at nausea, um, dyspepsia, dysphagia, to its swallowing, um, to do with reflux. So acid reflux you might have heard of. Again, weight loss. Um, abdominal pain, abdominal, abdominal distension, some problems with your stomach and kind of GI tract down there. Uh, jaundice, where your skin becomes yellowed. Um, ascites, again, swelling, but this can also refer to swelling other parts of the body as well. Um, and you're looking at changes in your bowel habit. So that's, again, is that diarrhea? Is that constipation? Again, we'll look at that in more detail uh, towards the end. Uh, neurological symptoms, so you're looking at visual symptoms, kind of head injuries, so headaches and other headaches, other causes of headaches, any limb weakness, any falls causing loss of consciousness, um, any confusion, so anything to do with the head, right? Head is pretty much the power of the body, it controls everything, so uh, it's really important to screen what's gone wrong. And ENT, again, you only get a week uh, of this, I believe, um, in year four still. Um, but again, ears, so hearing loss is a really key one, um, identify conductive versus sensory neural, um, discharge from your nose, epistaxis, fancy word for saying nosebleed, uh, facial pain and any jaw pain or claudication. So again, don't kind of worry about this right now. Uh, we're going to go over this in more detail in the coming slides. Um, so moving on to post medical history, it's um, more patient led here. But again, you want to screen for the main ones, so diabetes, hypertension, um, you want to screen for any heart failure, any asthma. Those are kind of the big ones that you want to screen for. Any other chronic conditions like COPD, especially if they're old, um, dementia. You want to kind of have a 
generic framework, but mostly the patient in the OSCE station will tell you what they have. Uh, the family history, again, uh, depending on the specific history you're focusing on. So if it's a cardiovascular history, history, you want to know about heart failure, you want to know possibly about rheumatic fever or the kind of infections um, of the heart. Um, and then drug history. So here you're kind of looking at what are they taking, um, any allergies they have that's really important to ask, a simple mark to get. Um, and are the drugs taking kind of working? Are they helping? Are they possibly making it worse and causing um, the symptoms? Um, so you can get a dry cough with ACE inhibitors you might have heard of. Again, you want to screen, is it pathological or is it um, caused by a drug? And then social history, you're looking at kind of um, the alcohol use and smoking, that's the classic too. Um, and then also asking about recreational drug use. Um, you can get a few um, infections like infective endocarditis or other kind of IV infections if you use um, drugs by sharing needles. So again, uh, a good question to kind of assess their exposure. Um, I can also give a kind of a hint into their kind of socio uh, socioeconomic status um, as well. Um, um, it's good to kind of screen for that as well. Um, their job, so where they work, are they employed? How is their job affected by this condition that they have or any symptoms they're developing? Um, are they worried about job security? Just kind of good to build uh, a good kind of rapport with the patient. Family situation, um, not said here, but also where they're living, really important, especially if they're old. So do they live on the ground floor? Do they live on the first floor? Are there stairs involved? Is there a lift involved? Is there ease of access? All of this is really important. Again, depends on the demographic. It could be a young person who is um, not as fit um, as a person of their age. Uh, so they may also find these things difficult that I've mentioned. Um, and how is it impacting them? So I talked about that. And this is where you kind of ice, ask about any concerns they have and how you want to kind of go forward and deal with it. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so summarizing, uh, make sure you kind of um, do this at the end. Or uh, what I do is, as they're going along, if you find out that you kind of, you're lost in your train of thought, just stop for a second, recap in your head what's gone on, what they've said, and say, okay, um, I'm just going to repeat back to what you've said, just to make sure I know uh, what's going on. And just kind of say like a line or two lines back to them, and they'll kind of nod their head or say, okay, no, that's wrong. And then that's a good way to kind of fill in time if you're kind of rushed for time and sound a bit more professional instead of um, having long breaks. Again, um, the feedback or handover comes at the end. You want to make sure it's concise. So presenting complaint, key symptoms, red flag features. Again, the main ones are fevers, weight loss and night sweats. But again, there's some other ones depending on the complaint. Um, past medical history, patient concerns, um, and kind of plan going forward. You want to take over, Grace? One second, let me just yeah. myself. Um, yeah, just to add on about the summarizing as well. So in an OSCE scenario, um, if you have the 10 minute stations, you'll tend to have some time left at the end. Um, so when you summarize, you can ask the patient, like, uh, is there anything I've missed out? Um, that I've just told you, and sometimes with the nice actors, they'll they'll tell you some stuff that you might have missed out. Um, so, yeah, that's a good thing to do. Um, so, if you just next slide, please. So, I'm going to move on to sort of specific history taken and what sort of questions to ask. So, tiredness is one that I think UCL quite likes um, because it's um, it can be lots of different topics. So you need to do a really good um, comprehensive history. So first things first, ask exactly like how long the tiredness has lasted for, if it came on really suddenly or if it was a slow onset and if it's like every day or if it's after they've done a certain activity. Um, the sleep pattern, and of course you always need to, with tiredness, it's really important to do the red flags I think get them done at the start because it can easily be a, um, a cancer history. Um, so the weight loss and the fever as well and changes in the appetite. So with sleep pattern and quantity and changes to their routine, um, important to ask about their sleep. Um, 
if they're sleeping longer than usual or shorter than usual, um, if they're waking up really early in the morning, because that could also be linked to things like depression. Um, and if about their sleep hygiene as well, if it's if if they're if they're not sleeping well, then you can ask, you know, are they um, using screen like two hours before sleeping, um, drinking too much coffee, etc. Anemia symptoms, um, so you can have breathlessness on exertion, palpitation, someone might feel quite dizzy. Um, if it's a girl, you can ask them about um, their period. So are they having any uh, really heavy periods compared to usual? Um, or they've noticed any changes in their pattern? Um, and also with anemia, ask about their diet. So they could be recently turned vegetarian or vegan, and you can advise, advise them about that. Um, so people with hypothyroidism, they can get tiredness as well. So you can ask them questions like, uh, are you... So with, with um, uh, hypothyroidism, the patient tends to be very cold. So sometimes the actor is wearing like a thick coat um, when it's really warm inside. That's kind of a hint for you. Or they might be like uh, visually sh just shivering in front of you. Um, they might have had weight gain or have this brain fog, uh, brain fog, which is usually a sign of hypothyroidism. Um, you can ask them about family history as well of any autoimmune diseases, because that tends to be um, something that UCL likes. So, for example, their mom might have had uh, Graves' disease or something. Um, so depression, of course, ask them about their mood, um, about their sleep. Diabetes, they might uh, go to the toilet more than usual or be really thirsty um, and sleep apnea. So they might be experiencing daytime sleepiness and um, they're usually quite a patient with a high BMI. Patient can have hyper hypertension as well. Um, ask if their partner um, points them out in their snoring or if, if the partner's noticed that they... Um, uh, gasp for air whilst they're sleeping. So these can all cause tiredness during the day. And past medical history, if they've had previous cancers or if they've been diagnosed with uh, anemia before, um, family history, so anything autoimmune is quite important or of course cancers and any drugs they're on. A lot of drugs can, um, so for example, if they're on things like amitriptyline, it can make them drowsier than usual. Um, so yeah, important to ask about drug history and social history. So if they're a big smoker or if they drink a lot of alcohol, um, or if they, for example, have like night shifts and things, or if their diet doesn't have uh, much protein and things, they can be very tired. Um, and with smoking and alcohol as well, they, they're more likely to have things like sleep apnea. So yeah, don't miss out those things. Next slides, please. Um, so with a chest pain history, it's obviously there's the very important Socrates, which is, um, um, uh, I assume you guys have come across in clinics and stuff. So it's sight, onset, character of the pain, uh, if it radiates somewhere, if there's any associated symptoms and how long it lasts for the time. Uh, if there's any exacerbating factors and what they would rate the severity out of 10. So that's the stuff that you can't miss out with chest pain histories. Um, so for example, if it was a, a, a MI, a myocardial infarction, um, they'd usually say it's like an elephant sat on their chest. It's a crushing central chest pain, which can radiate to their um, neck, uh, shoulder or the arm. Um, Keep in mind that with MIs, there's some silent heart attacks. So for example, if it's like an old patient, uh, an old diabetic patient, or it's a woman sat in front of you, they, they could be having like a silent heart attack where they don't have the characteristic um, chest pain that radiates to their arm, left arm. So with angina, it's usually offset by um, an activity. So if they're like walking around, um, and it should be alleviated by rest. So 
once they sit down and it's not better in like 15 minutes, that's more of a red flag that it might be an actual heart attack. Um, and the patient might have a history of angina. Uh, with PEs, uh, pulmonary embolisms, they can experience chest pains. So pleuritic pain, meaning when they breathe in, it's like a sharp um, stabbing pain. And uh, they might also experience shortness of breath. Um, I think with uh, pneumothorax as well, that could sometimes occur, a pleuritic chest pain. Um, and so, yeah, keep that in mind. Um, with pericarditis, yeah, it's a characteristic pain where if you sit, if the patient sits forward, that usually relieves the pain a little bit. Um, and uh, missed out on this, but there's also, if someone says there's a pain in the back, that's like a really tear, tearing, intense pain, and it came on quite suddenly, um, and they have a history of like hypertension, that could be an aortic dissection. And also, if a patient comes in with weight loss fever that's been going on for a little while, and they might be quite young, and they could have had something like a tooth extraction recently or their IVDU, so intravenous drug users, that could be a sign of infective endocarditis as well. Um, so yeah, ask all the important questions. The Socrates mainly will get you at least an idea of what it could be. Um, and with past medical history, you should ask them about recent travel, uh, if they've had previous admissions, um, any history of, uh, for example, sudden cardiac deaths in the family. Um, so anyone dying from a heart attack before the age of 50, I think it's quite important to keep in mind. Um, and if they've had things like cholesterol, high cholesterol, and if they're on um, drugs like statin. Um, with social history, really important to ask about alcohol and smoking, and if they do any exercise, because uh, they all if increase their chance of getting a heart attack if they're having a sedentary lifestyle and occupation as well if they have like a desk job um, yeah they might not be moving so much during the day um, so with family history yeah as I said cardi cardiovascular deaths in the family it could be strokes as well that's quite relevant um, and uh, hyperlipidemia so some some have quite a strong fam family history of uh, hyperlipidemia, which really increases the chances of having, uh, yeah, uh, heart, sorry, cardiovascular diseases. Um, so yeah, ask about drug history and uh, smoking, you have to ask uh, specifically how many they drink a day and how long they've been drinking, uh, sorry, how, how many they smoke a day and how long they've been smoking for. And if they don't smoke now, if they've smoked before, and how long they smoke for then. So quite a detailed smoking history is quite important for cardiovascular history. Uh, the next slide, please. So with breathlessness, um, I think the respiratory history will be covered later, but specifically breathlessness, um, you need to ask about um, the time frame when, if it's like a, a slow onset breathlessness that they've noticed, or if it's sudden. And in a history, you should ask specifically, can you walk from like a distance? So can you walk from the corner of this room to the other corner without getting out of breath? Or like, for example, on the way here, were you able to walk here or did you have to take the bus, et cetera? So, and then see how that's changed to um, recently or whenever they've noticed the change, how much, how much the difference is. So before they might have been able to walk to the supermarket, but now they can't, for example. Um, so orthopnea is when people have a heart failure. And so when they're lying down, they feel like um, they're really, really out of breath, even like they feel like they're drowning a little bit. Uh, with paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, basically when they're sleeping at night, um, they wake up gasping, gasping for breath because they're really short, short um, of breath. And usually these patients also sleep with 
uh, a lot of pillows on their back, so they're sort of a little bit upright. So when you go in to examine a patient and you notice lots of pillows propping them up, that could be a sign they have heart failure. Um, and diurnal variation, yeah, so it, it could be worse at night because they're lying down. Um, and yeah, so with heart failures, you, you should also see if their legs are swollen, ask, ask if they've noticed any recent um, pitting edema, or, well, don't use that language, obviously, but um, any yeah, swelling in the ankles. Um, and breathlessness can also indicate they might have valvular diseases or arrhythmias, um, so don't rule them out. And of course, there's stuff like asthma and et cetera, but that'll be covered in the, in the uh, respiratory history. Um, next, please. So with asthma, um, they'll have shortness of breath and uh, so diurnal meaning the, their breathlessness will be worse, um, I think when they wake up, so correct me if I'm wrong, sorry. Um, also, the patient might have a um, history of eczema, so any atopic illnesses like that, um, that that could tend to mean that they might also have asthma as well. And uh, you can you can also ask them if you know they have pets at the house um, or if they have any mold, etc. Um, with COPD, again, really important to ask the smoking history and if they've had any infections. Um, and also with, uh, with a um, breathlessness history, you can also ask if they have had uh, jobs like, that's, sorry, jobs that exposes them to asbestos, um, because it could mean that they have interstitial lung disease caused by asbestosis. Um, and any pets or mold in the house can also cause interstitial lung disease, as well as asthma. Um, also, if they've had radiotherapy or had some chemo, that can also cause um, interstitial lung disease as well. And if it's an old man that has no other symptoms other than um, shortness of breath on exertion, and a characteristic is a bibasal um, inspiratory crackle, um, that could mean they have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis as well. And they tend to not have a strong smoking background. Um, with the PE, yeah, you need to ask them if they've recently had any travels. So have they been on like a long haul flight? If they've been very um, just in bed for like three days straight, basically that increases the chance of having a PE. Um, if they're on the oral contraceptive pill, and if they if they are, have any active cancers or have had it in the last six months, or if they had any recent surgical procedures, because they all increase the chance of um, someone getting a pulmonary embolism. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so with syncopes and um, falls, the really important thing is you you want to differentiate if the fall is due to a cardiac cause or a neurological cause. Um, I think where with falls, obviously if it's in the elderly, there's a slight different um, question as to, you know, if, if it was like a mechanical fall, they've tripped, or if they're frail, you know, it could be that they can't see very well. But in, in fourth year, it's mainly to do with either cardiac or neurological um, differentiation. So, the way you'd ask these questions are set, um, splitting it in before, during, and after the fall. So, oh, sorry, and before you ask that, you you need to ask if if it if the fall was witnessed by anyone. So sometimes it's a family member that you're taking this history from as well. Um, and yeah, if it was witnessed, then they could kind of answer the questions about them having a seizure or not easier because they wouldn't know, uh, the patient wouldn't know if they had a seizure or not sometimes. So with before, during, after, the before section is ask them if they had uh, any funny feelings. So that could indicate an aura um, before a seizure occurring. 
Um, so they could have like deja vu feelings or um, feeling like feeling like something was about to happen, um, or they could have some visual um, symptoms as well. Uh, if it was a cardiac history, they could uh, sorry. If it's a cardiac cause, they could experience some lightheadedness, um, some dizziness before, and palpitations as well. So with um, dizziness, you need to ask. So with dizziness, they they feel like they're quite unstable. But with um, vertigo, you need to ask them specifically. Like, did you feel like the room was spinning? So that's the difference between dizziness, dizziness and vertigo. Um, have they ever felt like this before? And so during the fall, um, you need to ask if they've lost, um, so if they've uh, lost con continence, so if they've noticed they've wet themselves or they've bit their tongue, um, if anyone saw them move their limbs. So this, these will all be signs of a seizure. Um, and after the fall, how quick were they able to recover? So if they were confused or drowsy for a long time after the fall, that usually indicates it's a seizure, not due, not um, a cardiac cause. Um, with, their, with their falls, you need to ask if they had any head injuries. So did they hit their head? And if they don't remember, you need to screen them for head injuries. So for example, uh, have they vomited afterwards? Have they felt nauseous? Any scar, uh, any um, injuries they can feel on their head? Um, and you need to keep that in mind. So with, uh, with falls, you need to do a full cardiac and neurosystems review. So, you know, ask them about uh, any previous um, arrhythmias, um, neuro symptoms. So, for example, they may have had um, seizures uh, where they don't where they don't move their limbs. So, for example, like an uh, absence seizure, they'll they'll just be sat and they won't realise they've had a seizure. Um, but that's only if you have time. But the main thing is the presenting complaint. Um, so with past medical histories, obviously any cardiovascular risk factors they might have, so hypertension, high cholesterol, and with family history, might have had families with epilepsy or um, arrhythmias. And with epilepsy as well, um, so I think peaks in diagnosis occur when patients are young, obviously, but also I think people People in their 50s surprisingly have the second wave of getting new seizures. So, um, yeah, just because they're older, don't rule that out. Um, drug histories, important to ask about blood thinners, because if they're on blood thinners and they hit their head, it's a, it's a lot more serious. And uh, ask if they're on diuretics as well. Um, with social history, same as before, smoking, alcohol, lifestyle, diet, really important. Don't miss them out. Um, and yeah, next slide, please. So yeah, as I said, top differential. So with a cardiovascular fall, um, most likely would be an arrhythmia that they've experienced. They'll have um, had palpitations. And if if the station is nice, they might say they've experienced something before, but they've not actually fallen. Um, and yeah, screen for any risk factors. So with neurological falls, it's usually a seizure, um, loss of consciousness, and they don't. They might also not remember what happened before the fall. Um, and yeah, they may become very stiff and more rigid. That usually means someone will have witnessed the fall as well. Um, and as I said before, yeah, they'll be, they'll be very confused after the after the fall, and um, it will take a while to come around. Um, and also screen for any strokes. So ask if they've had any limb, we limb weakness or slurred speech, and 
yeah, take a very detailed past physical history. Okay, um, next slide, please. All right, um, I'll take over here now. Um, okay, let's go back to the slides. Yeah, so um, she kind of went through this in quite a lot of detail. Oh, um, sorry, can't yeah. see this. Can't see the oh, yeah, sound anymore. Oh, wait, 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 sorry. Give me a second. All right, there we go. Can you see now? Yeah. I'm not sure why that disconnected. Um, it's quite weird. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, um, she kind of explained this uh, before, but um, I've kind of used a mnemonic um, during my time in year four um, to kind of understand how I would kind of go through it because um, the recipe history, especially for kind of shortness of breath, it's quite kind of, um, it's quite a lot to think about, to be honest. So I use the mnemonic one resp. So um, again, I'm not going to explain too much about what they mean because I think Grace did a, a fabulous job of going, of going through kind of um, what they mean and um, um, what the connotations of them are. But um, O is for onset. So when did it start? Have you had it before? Has it changed over time? Um, N would be for nature. How does it change over time? Is it seasonal? Um, she mentioned kind of, is it worse uh, during the day or night? So asthma is actually worse in the night. Um, that's mainly because um, the muscles in your neck can relax around nighttime. Um, so again, they can kind of tighten more easily, your airway. Um, the second reason is um, kind of you might get a kind of a delayed response to any allergens you've been exposed to during the day. So like any pollen, any dust, any mites. And also if you're sleeping in a bed that's possibly got any allergens in the kind of the sheets, you can also get kind of exposure that way. Um, anything that makes it worse, so E is for exacerbating factors. So again, cold air. Uh, so normally winter is really bad for any respite illness in general, uh, but also dust, pollen, um, exertion as well. Um, so is it worse on exertion? Is it worse when you're lying down? Is it worse when you're um, kind of sitting up? R is for, for relieving factors, so inhalers uh, may make it better if it's asthma. Um, does rest make it better? Is it kind of exertion related? E is for exercise tolerance, so uh, you can either say, um, as Grace said, uh, how far can you walk from a certain point, or you can say how many stairs can you climb, or how many flights of stairs can you climb with the more fit? Um, and that kind of gives a good benchmark they can compare to um, kind of further on in their journey to see if they're kind of getting better, or worse or the same. Uh, P is for this kind of very complex word called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Um, basically, um, what this means, um, so nocturnal basically means nighttime, um, and it happens um, to people where they suddenly wake up from their sleep gasping for air. Um, and just basically ask them that in that exact wording, um, and if they do, it can kind of be um, uh, relating to a diagnosis of heart failure. Um, also asked about orthopnea, so how many pillars do you sleep with? Do you have to prop yourself up at night um, in order to go to sleep? And then again, uh, you want to ask about kind of other symptoms to do with the cardio rest system. So you want to ask about crushing chest pain, pleuritic chest pain, which basically means it's kind of around your lungs, around the front of your chest. Uh, it's more widespread. Hemoptysis, so cuffing up blood. Do you have any coughing? Um, are you coughing up any blood? Are you coughing up any sputum? Um, and are you wheezing? So is that more asthma related? Again, past medical history, any surgeries. So surgery itself is a risk factor for PE because you're immobile for quite a long period of time, depending on the surgery. Any admissions previously and what they entailed? Um, and what is the cardiovascular history? Um, do you have any asthma or COPD? Because they're quite common conditions, really. Um, asthma in the young and COPD in the old, uh, they're very common, so always ask about that. Any family history, um, especially looking at kind of things like lung cancer, so it's not actually on here, but definitely kind of always ask about fevers, weight loss, night sweats, that's kind of a given. Um, so you're looking for lung cancer there, they may kind of, um, they can definitely kind of put that in your case, um, any cancer really in general. Um, in terms of drug history, again, looking for allergies, any medications, so, for example, I said before, um, ACE inhibitors are kind of characteristic to give a kind of a dry cough. Um, so, again, that's an example of a medication causing a symptom and not an actual condition. So always ask about medications. And um, 
uh, it's really important to kind of um, make sure, especially in like older people, that not interacting to cause an issue. Um, allergies in general, again, if you have an allergic reaction to anything, your airway tightens up, right, when you get anaphylaxis. So again, that could present as like an acute episode of shortness of breath. Um, and then social history, again, smoking, uh, very characteristic of any lung problem. Um, if you smoke, um, like for a long period of time or a lot of cigarettes, that can build up and cause damage to your lung. Um, so one more thing with smoking is that what I would do is that I would um, think about pack years. So I'm sure you can Google this. It's a calculation where you convert number of cigarettes per day um, times how long basically you've been uh, smoking it. And you can get like a pack year calculation. It's, a bit, kind of, it's kind of easy to do after you've done it a few times, but it's very, um, you'll stand you in good stead in the exam when you say it and you make it stand out. Um, that's what you need for like the few extra marks. Um, alcohol, again, uh, pets, because you might have pet hairs causing um, a reaction from your throat. Um, it might um, cause kind of constriction of the airway and shortness of breath that way. And the environment, again, we're looking at kind of dust, pollen, uh, is that of pollution causing uh, respiratory problems. So moving on to the GI history, um, this, um, again, there's a lot to think about. It's not really one history. Uh, so I've kind of broken it down into the multiple layers of it um, to, for you to understand. So again, um, first thing is if they mention pain, you want to jump straight to Socrates. Um, so where's the pain? Uh, when did it come on? What kind of pain is it? The throbbing pain is a, um, a kind of a pulsing pain? Um, is it a boring pain? You want to know exactly what's going on in the patient and where it's spreading to. Um, so again, uh, with this one, what I like to think of is what's going on from head to toe. So what I do is I normally start with the um, kind of work from the head downwards. So I start with the throat. So again, I'm looking at dysphagia. So dysphagia basically means, do you have any pain when swallowing? So again, a lot of things can cause dysphagia. To name a few, you can get uh, esophageal cancer, you can get uh, strictures in your esophagus, you can get motor neuron disease. Again, um, that can also cause uh, difficulty swallowing because essentially your muscles um, don't work um, as well as they did beforehand. Um, really important to ask is solids, liquids or both. So if it's solids, um, it can be stuff like a stretcher that's allowing liquids to go through, but not solids. Um, if it's both, it can be cancer because, again, cancer grows kind of more maliciously um, over time. Gradually, you kind of see um, a uh, transformation from not being able to sol uh, swallow solids uh, to liquids. So solids, um, if you can't swallow solids, it's bad, but it's not as bad as swallowing liquids, right? If you can't swallow liquids, that means it's progressed to the point where it's kind of uh, done a lot of damage. So kind of think of solids as being bad, but liquids as being kind of even worse. So normally solids comes before liquids. Um, if you have difficulties kind of initiating the swallow as well, that can be things like myasthenia gravis, where you kind of have slowing of the movements. So again, you can have difficulty initiating um, the swallow in that and also motor neuron disease. Um, moving on to abdominal pain, which is again, a whole history in itself, uh, but kind of a few things to kind of notice with abdominal pain is es essentially Socrates. So you want to know where the pain is. And there's kind of a lot of images in Google where you can kind of look at a nine quadrant view of the abdomen and different pain differentials for each quadrant. Um, I'm not going to bore you with that um, and you can have a look at that yourself, but it's generally uh, a few kind of uh, buzzwords they like to use um, or you'll kind of hear um, around the ward. If it's kind of a loin to groin pain, you're looking at renal colic, which means renal stones. Um, that's kind of a pain that radiates from your loin uh, to your groin loins, which is kind of like the sides, so like the um, your sides or like the kind of the, the back towards the front side. So it's the sides of your um, abdomen going down towards your groin. Uh, so that's very characteristic of renal colic. Um, if you have, um, again, a flank pain, so your sides radiating now to your back, that's a very characteristic of palynephritis, which is again an infection around your kidney. Um, and um, if you have a pain that's in the epigastric region, so that means that's above um, kind of the abdomen towards your chest region. So the upper part of your abdomen. That could be kind of a peptic ulcer. So an ulcer in general, that can be acute pancreatitis. 
So I'm not kind of doing a definitive list. I'm just kind of giving you some um, some differentials to think about going forwards. Um, so yeah, abdominal pain is really important. I'll kind of focus on that in itself, but also really, uh, really kind of keep in mind that they may say abdominal pain, but it may end up being chest pain. So heartburn or indigestion is a bit higher up, but because it's kind of widespread and it kind of stays there, um, they may mistake it for abdominal pain. So really ask them, where is the pain? Uh, it's a really important question to know, is it lower down where the actual stomach is and the abdomen is, or is it higher up where the heart is? That's really important to know. So moving kind of, um, not really down, but kind of more general now, is looking at the skin. So is the skin jaundiced? So jaundice basically means a yellow color of the skin. Um, essentially, it means that there's a problem um, with the GI system. It's not working um, as good as it should. This can happen, especially with problems of the liver. So you're looking at differentials like hepatitis, um, any alcohol related um, kind of hepatitis or other damage to the liver. Um, malignancy it should always be a kind of um, something you think about as well, um, especially of the liver because it spreads, uh, cancer kind of spreads to the liver quite aggressively um, and it spreads to the liver quite commonly as well. Um, and you also want to think about, is it itchy? So um, if it's itchy, it can be kind of um, uh, common in like post-hepatic jaundice. Um, so again, jaundice can either be pre-hepatic, which is before the liver, the intrahepatic, which is in the liver, so like hepatitis is, is intrahepatic, um, or post-hepatic, so after the liver. Um, so that can be like a gallstone, that can be like a pancreatic cancer as well, that would be post-hepatic, um, and that characteristically uh, causes itching. Um, also ask about bruising, that's also common uh, with liver issues. Um, the reason is because liver um, kind of helps with um, clotting and um, other stuff related to basically healing. So if you have bruises that are not healing over time, so chronic bruises, that's again a sign of uh, liver damage and overall GI kind of um, misbalance. Okay, let's kind of move down. So we're moving down to the waterworks now. So again, you ask them kind of, um, have been passing urine properly? Um, any issues with that, any pain. So again, you want to know, is there any infection, possibly like a UTI that's occurring um, down there that's causing any issues? So again, that's um, one of the main differentials um, you're looking at with that. Again, cancer is always, um, cancer's always uh, a, a top differential as well to think about whenever you have pain anywhere. And also the color of the urine um, is normal colored, uh, the amount, again, all questions you want to think about. Uh, moving on to the bowel habit. So again, um, with this one, you want to look at, um, is it constipation, is it diarrhea? So um, again, um, it's really important to know which one it is. Sometimes it's both. So it can be constipation and diarrhea fluctuating uh, between them. So it's really important to know what's going on um, and how has it changed over time. Also, blood in the stool or mucus in the stool is really important as well. Uh, again, so you're looking at differentials like cancer, uh, especially colorectal cancer, which characteristically, uh, characteristically causes uh, blood in the stool. So you want to rule that out um, really as soon as possible. Um, so tenesmus, basically kind of having the urge to go to the toilet. Um, and you've got melena, uh, which is basically having this dark, really kind of um, foul smelling stool. Um, now that's characteristic of a upper GI bleed. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's an upper GI bleed. Um, the reason is because um, on the way kind of down uh, kind of your GI system, it's not fresh blood. So if it's colorectal cancer, it'll be fresh blood because it's near to the site of where uh, the stool comes out of. If you think about upper GI bleed, it makes its way down all of the GI components, your intestines, and eventually goes out to the rectum. So that would be um, mixed in all the, with all the kind of the products of um, digestion and therefore it's going to be a darker color, it's going to be more foul smelling um, and that's characteristic of upper GI bleed. Um, again, eating habits, recent travel we want to know as well. Are they eating properly? Is it just like a dodgy takeaway they've had last night, right, that's causing the issues? Any recent travel, uh, especially to countries where they have kind of poorer hygiene, um, have they shared needles and so on? Have they got an infection essentially from another country? So you want to look at also, again, cancer symptoms, so fever, weight loss, night sweats, that's also really important. So post medical history, looking at malignancy, and again, same as before really for the family history, drug history and social history, I'm not going to bore you with um, the kind of fine details, they're the same as before. 
uh, it's really after smoking alcohol, any travel and any drug use. Moving on to headache, again, a really important history as well. So again, headache is head pain, quite simply. So looking at Socrates, uh, but what I like to do is split it into acute and chronic. So acute, the main three are subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is uh, characteristically um, a sudden thunderclap headache, like the back of the head or occipital, it's called. It's quite a sudden headache. Again, um, it's hemorrhage inside your brain. So it's very serious, really important to rule this out um, or rule it in uh, for potential treatment as soon as possible. Meningitis, again, you've got kind of a triad of photophobia. So like not being able to look at, night, uh, at lights. So if you look at lights, um, you kind of, um, it hurts your eyes or it's really uncomfortable. Neck stiffness. So again, that's very characteristic of meningitis as well, because essentially meningitis is an infection of your meninges, right? Which is, which is kind of along your spinal cord. Um, a rash, but also more characteristically, you have a fever. So photophobia, neck stiffness and fever, always think about meningitis. And obviously you can also have trauma, uh, trauma to the head that can cause um, maybe temporary, but maybe even permanent um, headache, depending on where um, the head is hit. And if it's a more fragile region, like um, around your temple or part of the head. Uh, chronic issues can include migraine. So again, a lot of people have migraine. So where they have auras, auras essentially events that occur before the headache comes on. So where people may see kind of visual symptoms like floaters in their vision, they also kind of have some numbness or weakness in their legs. Um, and this can occur before the actual headache begins. And they kind of know it's going to occur in the future. It's kind of predictor event. Um, photophobia again can occur with this. Um, and it can usually affect their kind of activities of daily living, which is ADLs, because it occurs, uh, it can occur quite frequently and in clusters as well. GCA is giant cell arthritis. So in this one, characteristically, you get jaw claudication. So you get pain when kind of opening the jaw or chewing. So pain when chewing, um, really characteristic of GCA, which is essentially inflammation of your temporal artery. It's related to temporal arthritis. Um, essentially, it Temporal arthritis can also lead to GCA. Um, GCA is pretty much the worst um, manifestation of temporal arthritis. Um, you can get irreversible vision loss. Um, so it's really important to treat this as soon as possible. Refer them to ophthalmology. You give them steroids normally. Um, and if it's early or um, if it's early enough, um, they can reverse their vision loss. If it's not, then sadly they've lost their vision in that side. Um, you can also get scalp tenderness. So they'll usually say um, when combing their hair, they feel um, um, they can feel uh, very tender around the scalp. Uh, that's, again, a very characteristic presentation of GCA. Um, so really, main thing is ask about vision, because um, as you know, the brain and the eyes are interconnected. And it's really important to know what's actually happened, what part of the brain is affected. And is the vision loss or vision um, kind of deterioration, is it? reversible or irreversible. Um, and it's really important to know that. Uh, so post medical history, again, has it happened before? What happened when it happened before? Uh, neurological history, um, and then you look kind of looking at family history, uh, drugs, so you're looking at anticoagulants. So anticoagulants basically prevent coagulation or lower the risk of coagulation or clots, but they can also increase your risk of bleeding or, or hemorrhage, in other words. So again, um, good to know. Um, if they're taking any anticoagulants, and if so, is that contributing to their increased uh, risk of hemorrhage or other brain issues? Um, again, cardiovascular medications can also affect um, their um, uh, ability to develop headaches uh, and are linked to some headaches in general. And again, social history is always uh, pretty much the same, smoking, alcohol, travel. Um, I always ask about stuff like jobs um, um, and how that's been affected. Um, now, the last one is fever in the returning traveller. So this one is quite a generic history. Um, I've not seen this one come up uh, in an isolated station before, to be honest. Um, and it's essentially fever. Um, and it encompasses quite a lot of topics. So just treat it as it is, right? So you're looking at fever first. So any patterns to the fever? Uh, when did it come on? How long does it last? Any symptoms and how they developed chronologically? Then you want to kind of dive into system reviews to find out what is causing the fever. Is it a respiratory problem? Is it a neurological problem? Is it an abdominal problem or a GI problem? Um, or is it a skin infection? 
right, or skin issue. Again, you also want to look for cancer as well, so weight loss, fevers and night sweats, it's really important. And then travel history is kind of um, a main part of this as well. So you want to look at where have they gone, how long have they gone, have they gone to an area where there's lower kind of standard of hygiene or food hygiene, uh, how is that accommodation, were they kind of um, in poor accommodation with like bed bugs and so on, was in food and water safe, were they taking the immunizations before leaving, any prophylaxis taken, were they swimming in open lakes? Again, you can get quite a few infectious diseases uh, from swimming in um, kind of still lakes. Um, you can get some infections, um, some nasty infections from that as well. And piercings, tattoos, surgeries are really important. Again, they may be sharing needles uh, in some countries. Um, sexual issues is important as well. It may be a kind of STI. It may be uh, another uh, kind of sexual, um, sexually transmitted disease. Uh, that's good to know about. Um, and contacts, um, as in who have they uh, been in contact with? So if they have a disease that's transmissible, it's important to know um, who their contacts are so they can kind of uh, quarantine or isolate for the recommended period of time. And again, post medical history, looking at previous infections, any chronic conditions, um, you're looking at their drug history. So looking at, again, prophylaxis, immunizations. Are they up to date? Are they kind of taking their medications as they should be? Family history, again, TB, malaria are kind of two big differentials for this. Uh, so TB is uh, a problem more in other countries around the world, so it can kind of be brought back from travellers coming back to the UK. Um, and malaria, again, is uh, more endemic in other countries um, around the world, um, like Africa, um, continents like Africa, you've got um, South Asia as well. It's more common there. And social history, you're looking at, again, smoking, alcohol, IV drug use is more important here, um, and living situation and other people's at risk. Um, so it's really important to kind of think of others, not only this patient, but also others where you can kind of limit the damage early. All right, um, so that's the end. it will be grateful. So I'd be grateful if you guys can fill in this feedback form, just scan the QR code and it should bring you to the page um, and it would help us greatly. If you have any questions, I can stay behind for around five minutes and I can answer any questions you guys may have. So yeah, fill in the feedback form and then you can ask any questions. Thank you very much. It's been really useful. No worries. I'm going to put it in the chat. If you don't want to unmute, um, that's fine as well. I assume there's no questions. <laughs> um, I think the meeting will stop recording automatically. I, I did just remember a question, sorry. Mm -hmm. Go for um, it. You know with the systems review, mm -hmm. is it yep. that, it might be a bit silly, but is it like you, depending on what the patient has come in with, you specifically ask those questions, or is it like after you've explored their presenting complaint, you ask, like you check out the other symptoms just in case, mm, in case yeah. like you miss something? Yeah, good question. Um, uh, so basically, what I did was um, the main thing is you want to get the bulk of the marks from what they present with. So if it's like a GI problem, you want to go through all of those kind of GI symptoms um, and kind of focus in on what's going wrong. Now, if you at any point, um, let's say completely forget the GI system or feel lost, um, you can ask the relevant um, questions in the other symptoms, uh, in the other sections as well. Uh, but the main ones I would say is the kind of the category that the presenting complaint falls under and systemic symptoms. 
And then before you move on to past medical history, I would quickly run through the other ones as long as you're not rushed for time. If you are rushed for time, then honestly, it's probably better to get the easy marks of past medical history, past family history, drug history, social history. Um, because at least in year four, from what I found out, the presenting complaints are quite um, directed at one speciality. They're not kind of gastro and cardio, for example. The only one where there's a bit of overlap, where I definitely recommend doing both, is cardio and resp. As you can see, there's quite a bit of overlap, isn't it? Shortness of breath, uh, palpitations and so on. Um, so cardio and resp kind of go hand in hand. The other ones, gastro, neuro, ENT, are kind of uh, separate, if that makes sense. If you have time, definitely do ask or run through the list as much as you can. If you don't, just move on after you've kind of got the necessary information. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you so much. That's really um, helpful because I was always quite confused about it. But yeah, yeah. thank you. It, for you guys, is it still 10 minutes for your... Or was it five? Yeah, it's all of it 10 minutes. Ah, I wish we had that last year. Uh, yeah, you're good then. Uh, then you probably have time um, to kind of run through everything. Um, if it's if it was five minutes, then you kind of don't have time. We didn't have time to uh, run through all of the um, everything, right? So um, yeah, 10 minutes, it should be enough time for you to run through everything. Thank you. No worries.